Chapter 18 The Inner Game of Tennis by W. Timothy Galway 1974 In a nutshell, your body is smarter than you think. Trust it to achieve the goals you have set. When Galway wrote The Inner Game of Tennis in the 1970s, there were not many books on the mental side of sports. It was thought that relentless practice of physical skills combined with sheer willpower made the best players. Galway's experience as a tennis player and a coach, however, was that willpower and positive thinking were not reliable bases for a great game. You cannot force your brain and body to achieve results, he discovered that there's a much easier route to performance, which involves letting the intelligence of the body and the unconscious mind express what it knows. The inner game of tennis combined Galway's background in education with his tennis experience to create a truly original work that became a surprise bestseller. With its emphasis on equality between teacher and learner, it was also the seminal work in the personal coaching field. A new way to play. The conventional way of the tennis coach is to criticize every detail of your game and give you a hundred instructions about what to remember when you step onto the court. But this is not the way the body likes to play. As a tennis pro, Galway found that asking players simply to watch him take shots was more effective than issuing instructions, because you learn more effectively by letting your unconscious mind absorb images of good play. His conclusion was that conscious trying, directed by the conscious mind, often produces negative results. You know this instinctively by the fact that when you're playing at your best, you're not thinking in a technical way about your shots. You're a fluid unity of mind, body, court, and racket. You are, to use Mihai Csikszentmihalyi's famous term, in a state of flow. On a good day, it all seems easy. If this ability to master the art of effortless concentration is the basis of the inner game, how do you go about it? Can it be created at will? The Two Selves As a player and trainer, Galway noticed that most people who have had tennis lessons know the correct way to make a shot. The problem is acting on what you know. Once you have the skills, your mental game is the problem. You sabotage your play by putting yourself down after a bad shot, worrying about the consequences of losing or coming to terrible conclusions about your abilities. Galway's discovery was that when someone goes out onto the court, two people are playing. Self one, the instructing, motivating, calculating coach, and self two, the one who actually goes out and plays. The first self is the teller, the part of you that shouts, come on, to put more intensity into your game, while the second self is the doer, playing with a storehouse of memories of every shot he ever played. Without the badgering of self one, self two could play brilliantly. The further self one takes matters into his own hands, forcing instructions to improve play, the worse the play actually gets. Quiet the Mind Galway's experience as a tennis coach underwent a transformation. He moved from being a technical instructor of good shots to simply being a quiet model of good play. Instead of criticizing or complimenting his students, he would just ask them to watch him over and over, then let their mind and body unconsciously replicate his actions. By discouraging judgments from either student or coach, the player's ability was revealed and their potential could be realized students would discover their shots rather than manufacture them. Galway quotes the Zen master D.T. Suzuki, Man is a thinking reed, but his great works are done when he is not calculating and thinking. Uncluttered with words or instructions, a still mind makes for the best performance. An unquiet mind starts to judge. 
we like to say that was a terrible shot, when in fact it was a shot, not good or bad, and we've tagged meaning onto it. Once you've given an emotional meaning to an event, you're less able to be fully aware of the next moment because you're caught up in emotion. You will not be able to see your play clearly, only through the mists of fury or despond. If you can notice what's happening without too much judgment, you will naturally maintain concentration and seize opportunities. If you keep judging yourself negatively, it will add up to a negative statement about your whole self it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Paradoxically, success comes when you temporarily withhold judgments of success or failure, but notice what is. Without such distortions, you can be calmly effective. To play at your best, you must live every second in the present. This is concentration. The easy way to concentration is through noticing all the details of the game the way the ball spins, the sound it's making when it hits the racket, the way your arm is moving to take a shot, your breathing. While on the surface this may seem a bit dreamy, it's in fact the opposite, because the moment you really notice things, you're not worrying about what will happen next or hitting yourself for the point you missed. All your energies are focused on this moment, this point. The burst of energy, creativity, and resolve that comes from existing in the moment is what the writer Eckhart Tolle calls the power of now. Larger Rewards The inner game of tennis is interesting because it asks what success is. For Galway, it turned out that winning games was less important than overcoming his nervousness on court. Playing to the best of his abilities without sabotaging his game with poor thinking, this was victory. People who look only for measurable success, Galway says, can have a one-dimensional existence. It's possible to go through life being so focused on external achievement that you forget to appreciate the wonders of nature, neglect to love those closest to you, and never stop to reflect on your broader life purpose. You need to make a distinction between a compulsion to succeed for the sake of winning and a desire for success that will enrich your life and those of others. As Galway puts it, winning is overcoming obstacles to reach a goal, but the value in winning is only as great as the value of the goal reached. In other words, the purpose of success is not necessarily the achievement of a goal, but the self-knowledge that you gain in striving toward it. The inner game of tennis is very much influenced by Eastern teachings, particularly Zen Buddhism. Galway's premise is that through not being attached to the fruits of victory, that is, winning the trophy, you paradoxically become free to play the game for itself in a more relaxed and powerful state of mind. Through non-attachment, winning is more likely. Tennis, or any other sport, is simply the medium through which you learn more significant elements such as concentration, Galway says. Working on your inner game is worth doing because if you can improve your concentration or be more relaxed under pressure, these skills are obviously going to benefit every area of your life, not merely the one you trained your mind for. In his 1970s language, Galway describes this as unfreakability. The inner game of tennis laid the foundation for today's personal coaching industry. It put forward ideas that are now commonplace in coaching, such as trusting people to come up with their own solutions, asking questions instead of instructing, visualizing successful outcomes, and appreciating the value of each moment. Its ideas were important to the emerging field of sports psychology, and the corporate world also latched onto it. Galway's comment that almost every human activity involves both the outer and the inner game explains its wide impact. The book helped to pave the way for today's view that work should be a means of self-expression in addition to being merely a way to make money, and has contributed to the realization that relaxed concentration, not fierce self-punishment, more effectively 
lead you to true success.